Okay, um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, we make these things. This is a, this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a, it's a tiny computer that uh, we hope will teach children to, uh, to program computers. Now, I'm going to throw these. I have two of them. I had, I had eight of them until I arrived in Iceland, at which point I was mugged by hungry geeks. Uh, I now have two of them, and I suspect by this evening I will have none of them. So I'm going to throw these into the audience so people can have a look at them. I said, I'm going to throw one of them to sort of row three. This is one that's not in the box, so I'm going to throw it. Oops. Yeah, I can't throw it. Yeah, this one I'm going to throw harder. Um, I went on a presentation skills course, and they said that throwing sharp objects hard at the audience is a bad idea, unless... <laughs> Unless, unless, unless you're a ninja, in which case you probably are okay. There we are. Okay, cool. Um, just take it out of the box and uh, take a look at it. Um, okay, so um, I guess what I thought I might do is I'll talk a little bit about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of Raspberry Pi, tell you a little bit about uh, why we're doing it, the problem that, uh, that we discovered that made us want to do it, uh, maybe a little bit about some of the experiences we've had in trying to do it, uh, and then maybe just try and relate it to some of the, some of the other things that, we, uh, that we've heard about over the last day and a bit. Um, so Raspberry Pi is something I personally have been working on for about six years. Uh, it goes back to my time as a, uh, as a PhD student at the Computer Laboratory in Cambridge. Now, <clears throat> while working as a, um, while working as a, a well, doing my PhD, while finishing my PhD, I was working as what we call a director of studies. Now, the role of a director of studies at uh, Cambridge is to coordinate the undergraduate teaching at your college uh, and also to go out and interview, uh, go out and find you know, fresh, blood, fresh meat, go out and find um, high school students who, uh, who would like to come and study computer science and then interview them and pick the best ones. Now, um, it's, it's, a fun, it's a fun job, um, but we, it was also becoming a very depressing job. I did this for several years, and I was doing this over the middle, middle part of the last decade, which is about 10 years after I arrived at Cambridge as an, an undergraduate. And what we discovered was that uh, when, I, when I was a, an undergraduate, we were, um, we were oversubscribed by about six to one. Cambridge courses like to be oversubscribed by about six to one, because um, it gives you a chance to really pick, pick the, very, the very best people to come and study. Um, and we, uh, so we'd gone from having, we have about 80 places, we went from having about 500, we had about 500 applicants in 1995. Um, and of those people, we could rely on the vast majority of them having a very deep understanding of one or more pieces of computer hardware. So they would walk in the door, and the very first thing that we had to do with the majority of these students, and I was one of them, uh, was to break them down and convince them that they didn't know everything. And uh, those of you in the room who, uh, who have a um, computing background, the way we used to do this was a thing called functional programming. Um, we used to take these people who'd been hacking in machine code since they were eight, and we used to make them hack in, in, in Haskell and ML and stuff, and that would convince them after a term that they knew nothing, and then we could then start to build them up again. Uh, and that was a wonderful luxury. Uh, and the department had grown, the de our department had grown fat and happy uh, on the back of this stream of incredibly talented young people. Uh, incredibly talented and incredibly knowledgeable young people. Now, by the time I became a director of studies in 2005, um, our applicant numbers had halved. So we'd gone from being oversubscribed by a factor of six to oversubscribed by a factor of between two and three. Um, and those young people coming in the door, they no longer had that kind of deep understanding of how computers, of how computers work. Um, they, the best ones maybe had done a little web programming, and there's nothing wrong with web programming, uh, but it did mean that in a Cambridge course which has 60 weeks of contact time to turn you from a high school student into somebody who can start a, P a, a British PhD program, so that's a three-year PhD program, um, uh, you had to spend maybe the first 15 or 20 weeks of that bringing these students up to a level of understanding that we had previously been able to rely on, and that was a disaster. Um, so a group of us at the computer laboratory started to look around to see why this might have happened. Um, and there were lots of competing explanations to this. Um, but the one that we, the kind of hypothesis we decided we were going to test was that um, when I was a child in the 1980s, I had a computer. I had a, a BBC microcomputer. Uh, I had it in my, in my bedroom. Um, and I could, I, I, I learned to program on this. But this was not a machine which I bought in order to learn to program. It was a machine I bought for other reasons. It was a machine my parents bought me um, to, uh, uh, to do my homework on. And yet when you turn it on, it goes beep. And the first thing you can do is, is to program it. And this, I think, maybe ties into one of the points from earlier about choice architecture. That this is, a, this is a machine where the default choice when you turn it on is to write a computer program. Now, you can choose not to write a computer program. You can cho choose to put a tape into the machine and load a game. Or you can choose to start a word processor. But this is a machine which lures you into programming. And of my contemporaries at school, 
a very large number of them knew at least how to write that two-line program, 10 print, I am great, 20 go to 10, or something filthier, uh, and then go into a computer store and type that into all of the machines and then hit enter on all of the machines and then run out of the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. It was great times. Um, uh, and, and I, um, uh, uh, what this meant was that of my contemporaries, everybody who had an aptitude for computing, who had a, a latent aptitude for computing, was typically exposed to the possibility that they might become a computer programmer. And this was where we felt that our stream of people who come from now, if you look at the early 1990s, this ecosystem of 8-bit microcomputers. So in the UK, this was primarily the BBC microcomputer and the ZX Spectrum. Uh, in the United States, I believe it was machines like the Commodore 64 and the TRS-80 and the Timex, which was the, the uh, US analog of the, of the Spectrum. Um, this ecosystem was eaten from both ends. So it was eaten from below by games consoles. Now, games consoles, of their, by their very nature, by their business model, are, are not programmable devices. Um, the, uh, all of these closed, many of these closed platforms, and it's not just games consoles, many of these closed platforms um, are sold to you at a loss. They're subsidized, the hardware is subsidized. And therefore, the business model of the platform holder requires them to lock the platform down in order that um, they, can, they can extract, so, so they can extract royalties on the, on, on the software to recover their investment. Um, so that kind of ate the low end. Um, crudely in the UK, that ate the ZX Spectrum. Um, from above, this system was eaten by the PC. Now, the PC, of course, is an awesomely programmable piece of hardware. In many respects, um, we're in a better situation than we were in the 1980s because a PC is a massively more powerful piece of, of hardware, and all of the tools that you require to program it are typically available f for free off the internet. However, coming back to the, uh, the, um, the, the kind of choice architecture um, uh, view of this, um, you have to want to go and download those. So there is this tiny little energy barrier separating you from programming your PC that the vast majority of people never cross. In addition, the PC is a, um, it's an expensive piece of hardware. It's an expensive investment for a family. And we have at least anecdotal evidence that um, the parents will discourage their children. They have a PC, which is typically horrifically virus-ridden, um, but they will discourage the, um, the, 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 the child from installing development tools on this machine because if you take down the family PC, it's like taking out the family car. You know, you wouldn't let your child uh, t dismantle your, fam your family car to find out how it worked. You might let your, um, you might let your child dismantle their bicycle um, because a bicycle is both simpler and the, um, uh, the, the um, bad scenario that will occur if the child uh, destroys their bicycle backs and as the child has to walk around a lot, not that the family can't you know, drive to the shops. Um, so a group of us at the computer laboratory sort of started to think, you know, could we produce a thing which was an analog of a bicycle? Could we produce a thing which will fill in a child's life um, the same position that their bicycle does, something which is unambiguously theirs uh, and which they can use to get some of those experiences that we had in the 1980s? So we had a little think about, um, about what we could try and build. Um, we thought it had to be um, fun. Uh, looking back to the 1980s, uh, it had to have some use which was not just, a, just, not just programming. It had to have a hook to get people in. Um, and so in the case of the device we ended up building, that hook is very, very powerful multimedia. We built a device which is competitive in terms of multimedia performance uh, with a lot of currently shipping games consoles. Um, it had to be programmable, obviously, um, and it had to ship with the programming tools. So we needed to eliminate that little step that, is, um, that was preventing people from, from getting involved in programming. Uh, it had to be robust. This is a device which uh, we want it to belong to the child. We want the child to be able to use it at school. We want the child to be able to use it at home. So it has to survive hundreds of being shoved into a, into a school bag. Um, even in its uncased form, which is the thing that I've handed around, it is actually reasonably robust. You can. I've done the experiment. I've pushed it in out of my, uh, uh, my often you carry them around in my pocket. Um, so we did have something which was robust. And finally, we needed to have something which was cheap because we were aware that we are asking people to buy a whole new piece of hardware. Right? We are, um, it, it's extremely difficult to ask people to do that. Uh, and so we had the idea we would make it cost the same as a textbook. And we, so we thought, $25, um, which shows that we have no idea what textbooks cost. Um, <laughs> but but it, was a, it, was a good, it was a nice, challenging stretch goal for us. Um, and well, we've been working on this uh, for, for, for a long time. And you can see that you know, we were trying to solve this very, very parochial little problem. We were trying to solve the, Cambridge, Cambridge, the UK Cambridge admissions problem. Uh, and we imagined that 
we might be able to make 1,000 of these, maybe 10,000. Our wildest dreams, we might be able to make 10,000 of these devices. Uh, that might be our, our total lifetime sales. Um, and we kind of trudged along. Uh, and about this time last year, we got to the point where we had some prototypes. And we were proceeding at our own pace. Uh, and one of the things we very much wanted to do was we very much wanted to put the BBC brand on this. Um, this is some, this is a, um, we're very nostalgic for my, my BBC Micro. That was an absolutely wonderful machine. I want to put the BBC brand on it. So I kept having these meetings with the BBC. I'd go in and have a meeting with the BBC. And uh, the, it would turn out that various aspects of competition law, they're a state-funded entity, various aspects of competition law prevented us from putting the BBC sticker on it. Uh, and the la our last gasp attempt to do this, we had a meeting with a gentleman called Rory Kathleen Jones, who is a, um, he's a, a senior BBC technology correspondent. Uh, in May of last year, and he also said no. Um, but what he did say was, could I take a video of your cool little device and put it on my blog? Uh, and because we, are, uh, because we are the most incredible imbeciles in the world, we said yes. Um, so he took a video of it, just not doing anything, just holding it up, put it on his blog. Um, 600,000 YouTube views in two days. Uh, and those were an amazing two days, right? Because I, I was sitting there I was looking at YouTube, just pressing F5. You know, watching my number go up, and I was becoming more and more and more and more and more popular. And I remember sitting down with my wife, <clears throat> and I felt great. I remember sitting down with my wife on, uh, for dinner on the second day, and we just looked at each other, and we had this sudden appalling realization that we had promised 600,000 people we would build them a $25 computer. Uh, <laughs> and... and <laughs> uh, and so, so the last year, so, 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 so the last year, we made this, this kind of, at that point, we, we had this kind of spike of poverty, and we made this, this what turned out to be a, a wonderful decision, uh, although it's, it's hurt us from time to time, which is to write everything down, which is to write down in public, on a blog, everything that was involved in this one-year sprint to get from the point where there were five Raspberry Pis, and five prototype, oversized, over-cost Raspberry Pis in the world to try to ship these things out the door. Um, and so we, we started, a, we have a website, raspberrypi.org, uh, and we write down pretty much everything we do. Um, and this is, <clears throat> this has been wonderful for journalists because we've, uh, we've said, you know, we will try and get this out, this, this thing out of the door in November. Uh, and uh, of course, <clears throat> on the 1st of December, that generates a very reliable stream of Raspberry Pi's late um, uh, headlines. Um, but it's also, and it's generated just the usual kind of Twitter trolling. You know, we have uh, you know, people saying, why don't you just give up and die uh, on, on, on Twitter? <laughs> um, but it's also generated this enormous outpouring of support. And it's generated this, it's really made us aware that we are offering this thing that we thought was going to try and solve this, solve this little problem for a specific community of people. People trying to recruit children and the people trying to recruit them into computer science is a thing that a lot of people believe will, can have an impact in all sorts of areas that we never, that we never imagined when we started. So, um, to summarize where we are, we launched on the 29th of February this, this, um, this year, uh, which is really annoying because it, it denies us the opportunity to have first anniversary celebrations next year. <laughs> we didn't see that coming. Um, so, <laughs> Um, so, so, so that was fun. Um, we, uh, we've had numerous hilarious regulatory hassles, um, like the fact you have to get an FCC mark if you sell, uh, if you sell electronic products. I didn't know that um, until after we'd launched. Um, <coughs> uh, we sold, we, we took 100,000 orders. This is, took 100,000 orders on the first day. We took down the websites of both of our distribution partners. Um, there are currently, as of today, I believe, 200,000 of these devices in the wild. Uh, there'll be half a million devices by the end of Q3 and hopefully a million devices by the end of Q4. Uh, they're currently selling to uh, people like me. Um, uh, we have to satisfy, we have to fill, we have to flood fill the market of people like me and maybe many, some of you in this room. We have to flood fill this market before any of them can get to children. Um, <laughs> So we're, we're facing these we're facing these these these, these terrible success disaster problems simply of like uh, <laughs> um, we're very lucky we, we there is no way so so we are we we are a not for profit we're a, a charitable foundation in the UK we're not for profit and we um, we have no employees um, these things cost the ones that we're shipping mostly at the moment are the thirty five dollar slightly more expensive versions uh, we're going to be a thirty five million dollar a year computer company with no employees. Uh, and really nobody, really nobody has ever done that. So we've had all of these hilarious, all of these hilarious experiences, and it's, it's been, been really, been, it's been an amazing, an amazingly wild ride. And we've written all about it in public, which is, which is fun. Um, so I guess maybe two comments about resilience. Um, the first one, I mean, the first one is a very flippant one. 
uh, you have to be really resilient to do this. Um, you know, the, the, this, is, this is something where you know, we have benefited uh, from, as an organization, uh, very self-consciously attempting to keep everything that we do as fluid and flexible and responsive as possible. Uh, we have, the only way that we have been able to, um, uh, uh, the only way we've been able to, to grow to the scale we have was that at Christmas time, when we first had our first hints we might sell more than 10,000 of these, was to effectively completely reconfigure our business model from being a uh, very capital constrained um, hardware production and uh, hardware production and sales company to just being an IP licensing company who licenses the design and the trademark for the device to other people. So this is, you know, we are an organization that's tried to be resilient. We're an organization that completely reconfigured its business model two months before it launched its product. Um, and so, so that's the kind of flippant thing. I think the, I think the, more, um, I think the more important thing, though, is uh, what, we were what we were witnessing <coughs> at Cambridge was a kind of, a kind of slow motion disaster. Uh, and it's a slow motion disaster for our entire society. Um, we've seen in the last day that there are enormous challenges facing us as a species. Um, the world is not getting any simpler. And yet at the point where the world is not getting any simpler, we are, we are we're eating our seed corn. You know, we, we, um, we hire away all of the people who, all the people who could teach computer science to our children. Our computing industry is so, is so hungry for talent that it hires them all at large salaries into the, into the computing industry. You know, we steadily deplete our stock of um, computer science educators, technology ed engineering educators, um, and we don't pay enough attention to educating the, the, new, the next generation of people who are going to need to deal with a lot of these problems that we're bequeathing them. Um, so this is a, this is a, a, a it's a slow motion disaster that um, threatens to undermine our attempts to build a more resilient society over the next few decades. Um, but on a happier note, I think the response to what we've tried to do, not just among nostalgic middle-aged geeks, but among, um, among children, has been, has been so encouraging that I think if we, uh, as a little organization with very, very few resources trying to do this stuff, I think if we had not been pushing an open, an open door, we would have been doomed. And what we've discovered from the enormous wave of interest, the enormous wave of support from, uh, from, from, from industry, from educators, and from children themselves, uh, we've discovered there is an enormous appetite for this, that there was a latent demand for the sort of thing we're providing. Um, and that really, you know, I think there is hope. Uh, I have a wonderful, I, I deliberately don't have any slides with me, but I do have some wonderful pictures that I can maybe share with people offline later of... Um, children using the Raspberry Pi. I mean, I said that they're not getting into the hands of children. Of course, they are getting into the hands at least of the children of geeks. Uh, and there are a lot of geeks, and they, and they sometimes they manage to find partners and have children. Um, and, and so there were a lot of, lot of little geek children. Um, and, and we... <laughs> Uh, and we, we um, so, so these, um, uh, I have, I have a, a lovely slide set of just, of just of kids just playing with the Raspberry Pi, toddlers. There is a, there's a programming language called Je Compris, uh, which is pretty much targeted at toddlers. There's a programming language from out of MIT called Scratch, which is to targeted at the sort of you know, 5 to 12 age range. And we just, you know, it's got to the point now, because we have this interaction with the community, where, um, uh, where, where you know, we, every day, this has been a tough thing. We've had to be resilient. But now every day, one of the things that helps us in our resilience is the, are the pictures that p parents send in of their children using these, these machines to do exactly the thing that we hoped they would do with them. Um, so in summary, um, things are looking good. Come and visit us. We have a community. Come and join our conversation. Uh, and please, can I have my Raspberry Pis back? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Fantastic. Great, great, great.